Uh, my name is Paul Thaler. I am the Director of External Affairs for the National LGBT Bar Association. Uh, I want to thank you all for calling in today uh, to listen to our discussion on protecting our constitutional rights, the Gilby Whitford case. I quickly just want to go over the topic introduction and introduce our speakers. And then I'm going to pass along to Kathleen Hartnett, who will be moderating this discussion over the next 45 minutes to an hour. So uh, this call is going to address the Gilby Whitford case, which is the, the partisan gerrymandering case concerning Wisconsin's 2011 redistricting effort that went before the Supreme Court last week. Undoubtedly, this case will affect all of us, and we are fortunate to have three leading ex experts to break down the case there, have been, uh, there has been extensive media coverage on this case, and we are excited to hear from our speakers, including Paul Smith, who can tell us what it was like to argue the case before the Supreme Court. So for our three speakers, we have Paul Smith, who is the Vice President of Litigation and Strategy for the Campaign Legal Center. Uh, Paul joined the Campaign Legal Center in January, and he has more than three decades of experience litigating a wide range of cases. He has argued before the U.S. Supreme Court many times and has secured numerous victories, including uh, and important cases, important cases advancing civil liberties. Two examples are Lawrence v. Texas, the landmark gay rights case, and Brown v. Entertainment Merchants Association, which established First Amendment rights of those who produce and sell video games. Uh, our moderator will be Kathleen Hartnett, who is a partner at Boise Schiller Flexer LLP. Uh, since Kathleen joined the firm in 2016, she has played a leading role in major cases, including Waymo v. Uber and Ramini Street v. Oracle, and she has an active pro bono practice, including recently filing an amicus brief on behalf of the uh, League of Women Voters in Gilby Whitford. Uh, Kathleen came to the firm after serving five years in the Obama administration, first in the White House Counsel's Office and as Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the DOJ Civil Division, where she was responsible for the federal programs branch. Before her time in government, Kathleen was in private practice in, the, in Washington, D.C. for several years. And lastly, we have Liz Kennedy, who is the Director of Democracy and Government Reform for the Center for American Progress. Previously, Liz served as counsel and campaign strategist for Demos, working on voting rights, money and politics, and corporate accountability. Prior to this, Liz was an attorney in the Democracy Program at the Brennan Center for Justice at the New York University School of Law, working on issues of money and politics and democratic accountability. Additionally, Liz was the Deputy Director of Voter Protection for President Barack Obama's 2008 presidential campaign in Ohio, and she has worked in private practice. So uh, before I pass this over uh, to Kathleen, I just want to say to everyone who's listening in, if you have any questions throughout this, please feel free to email your questions to me at paul, P-A-U-L, at lgbtbar.org, and we'll try to get to them at the end um, so that way uh, our speakers can address them. Uh, so again, my email is paul, P-A-U-L, at lgbtbar.org. And with that, um, Kathleen, uh, do you want to take it away with starting the, the discussion? Absolutely. Hi. Um, thank you so much. This is Kathleen Hartnett. I'm honored to be on the call today with Paul and Liz. Um, what, what was not in my bio was that uh, one time I had the honor of serving as an associate uh, to Paul at, the, at Jenner and Block, and so it's um, really great to be reunited with him on this call. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I would like to, uh, you know, um, so I think we have two, uh, the speakers kind of um, help us run the full gamut of the issues here because we have Paul who was, you know, obviously responsible for the legal briefing and the oral argument, and then Liz who has been working on a lot of um, kind of both messaging and policy related initiatives about gerrymandering outside the courtroom. So I think I'll start with the courtroom and then we'll talk about the policy side and hopefully uh, join the two and uh, welcome your, you know, your, your, Liz and Paul, feel free to ask questions yourselves. If you uh, think that would be useful. But starting with um, kind of what at least I'm, um, I'm particularly interested to hear is uh, just Paul's experience of, of being at the oral argument. Um, obviously, there have been lots of public accounts, but as the person who argued both this case and then um, argued the Veith case, which was the most recent partisan gerrymandering case before the Supreme Court um, 13 years ago, I'm just curious about how your experience was um, in the argument. You have five new justices um, that you were dealing with this time as opposed to last time, and just kind of what key atmospherics you might share with us about your time in the court um, uh, at the argument? Well, uh, the Veep case was, as you say, 13 years ago, uh, and it got a lot less public attention. It, uh, the, the issue of gerrymandering has clearly come into public, the public eye in a big way as our politics has gotten more and more polarized and dysfunctional. Uh, so that made the case feel a lot bigger. Uh, and then uh, the other thing that was a major difference is back in uh, 
2003 when I was arguing that case, Justice Kennedy seemed very troubled uh, by the absence of a kind of standard of fairness and um, ways to measure how far from a standard of fairness any given map is. Uh, and he expressed, ended up expressing those concerns in a concurring opinion that he, he wrote back in, in that case that said, you know, I, I think this partisan gerrymandering stuff is terrible and it probably violates the Constitution, uh, but if you don't give us a standard so we can isolate just the worst ones and no, be confident we, we can identify those and deal with those and, it, and a place to sort of draw the line, uh, I'm not going to feel like I can do this for you. So uh, he kind of laid down that challenge. Uh, and uh, in this case, we have what we think is a definition of fairness, which is called partisan symmetry. The map should basically operate the same for each of the two parties if it's perfectly fair. Uh, and ways to measure how far from fairness any given map is, uh, there are three of them. One of them is called the efficiency gap that sort of tells you how, how much disparity there is between the two uh, parties and how the map operates. Uh, and as a result, at least I hope it's as a result of that, um, Justice Kennedy did not give me any questions at all uh, and asked um, some pretty difficult questions to the other side. So that, that was quite a, quite a different atmospheric because if, if there was ever a case when most people were, thought we were arguing to one justice, this was such a case. Uh, th there were five new justices, but um, the the, uh, the rest of the court, everyone had beforehand kind of said, well, we figured they'll go one one predictable way or the other, and there was no particular reason any argument to dis disabuse anybody of that. The conservatives were giving me trouble, and the liberals were giving them trouble. That's kind that's, of how it uh, works. that's very interesting. Yeah, I know exactly. With um, I guess fourteen or thirteen years to think about what you'd say to Justice Kennedy, and then having him. Uh, <laughs> He's more quiet than uh, one might expect. That that sounds interesting. I actually had um, a case in between where we tried to argue the same issue in the Texas congressional redistricting case in 2006. It was a case called LULAC where we argued a pure intent argument that they didn't have any reason to redo the map uh, except for partisanship because it was in the middle of the decade. And so I've now really argued the issue three times. Uh, maybe I'll get the third time as a charm. <laughs> well, did you, I'm, I'm interested in, in that that point of view too, and I was going to ask some questions. I'm kind of trying to analogize to to the you know LGBT uh, equality movement or other movements that take time publicly to de develop and kind of work in parallel with the court. But um, did you did you feel like this is enough time for this issue to come back to the court? It's been the right amount of time, or was that any part of the thinking of trying to get a case there not too soon and not too late? Or did this just well, kind I think, of happen? You know, it was not quite. It wasn't quite the same challenge as we had in um, in Lawrence of getting them to overrule Bowers versus Hardwick. They didn't. They didn't have a definitive ruling in the past. They have. Uh, there seemed to be actually agreement that this is a, a bad practice that is uh, indefensible under the Constitution. It was just a question of whether or not we could come up with standards, and so. Um, it didn't feel like it was too soon to come back with this. There were some questions from Justice Alito saying, you know, this efficiency gap's only been in the pub, uh, published literature for like two years. How are, we, how are we supposed to know whether it'll stand the test of time? But uh, I'm hopeful that the, the, with a real strong outpouring of uh, support from the political science uh, community and all of the amicus briefs that uh, we'll be able to scrape together five votes who think that we really do have a, a way to tell which are the worst gerrymanders and and how bad are they? And under those measures, the Wisconsin map is kind of one of the five worst gerrymanders uh, that has been drawn by any state anywhere in the United States going back to the 1970s. Uh, so, um, you know, that that made it a strong case. Thank you. That's that's very interesting. Um, you know, just building off of something Paul said about the change in public, um, you know, pr prominence of this issue and potentially public support for doing something about political gerrymandering. Liz, I was just kind of wondering what you've seen over this time period and kind of how, um, if you could give us some insight into the, you know, bo both why uh, why you think if uh, public interest has grown in this issue, but also what you you know your organization and other organizations are doing to help um, bring this issue to to light for for the public so that there's more public awareness about the the, the damaging um, effects of partisan gerrymandering. Sure. Uh, thank you, and thanks uh, to Paul for organizing this call, um, and to Paul for doing such a terrific job um, shepherding this uh, case and arguing it. Um, this is really a crucial issue. Um, it is uh, 
one of the really determining factors as to whether people will be able to receive fair representation uh, in government from their elected representatives is whether um, the system um, incorporates fair maps or whether they are uh, manipulated um, in, in decades past, perhaps more specifically along uh, racial lines and then now um, you know, more and more along partisan lines and particularly around uh, since 2010. So I think, um, you know, it, it's maybe a little bit of a chicken and egg question about whether um, there's been somewhat more organizing around public education around gerrymandering um, or whether um, or whether it's just that gerrymandering got so bad that uh, that there were lots of, you know, active litigation challenges. I mean, I will point to the 2010 redistricting cycle to say that, um, again, it's not that um, incumbent politicians hadn't tried to advantage themselves and their colleagues um, before, sometimes by party, sometimes just uh, to prevent competition for, for any party, sometimes just again to lock out um, racial minority voices from power. Um, but in 2010, it was really much, much worse. It was both uh, marrying the technological prowess of new map drawing uh, technology that enabled more and more aggressive uh, cutouts, intentionally labeled aggressive um, in the Wisconsin scenario. And then really also, I think the kind of um, anything goes in our politics that we've seen um, this kind of devolution in, in the last maybe 15 years uh, of kind of asymmetrical polarization and uh, more and more of the sense that kind of winner takes all um, that has led to this, you know, kind of both voter suppression in the voting rights um, case uh, cases uh, and then here denying fair representation through these um, through these unfair maps that really have, and I think that people are looking for explanations about why government has been uh, seemingly less and less responsive uh, to public policy preferences, to being able to solve the myriad challenges um, that we face both at the state and federal level. And you can really see the ways in which um, these distorted districts have led to um, distorted policy outcomes. Uh, Paul mentioned that in Wisconsin, the Wisconsin map was really um, one of the, you know, one of the worst in the country that was drawn in 2010. Um, just to uh, give that, to explain a little bit more about what that means to be the one of the worst maps in the country. In 2012, uh, Republicans lost the statewide popular vote, this is in the um, the state house in Wisconsin, candidates, Republican candidates got less, fewer votes than the Democratic candidates standing for election, and yet they gained a super majority of the Wisconsin legislative seats. They gained 60 out of 90 seats. And then in 2016, even though Wisconsin got uh, Wisconsin Republican candidates got 53% of the votes cast for the two major parties, they received 64% of the seats. So that I think is, um, you know, and then I could I could carry on to talk about the policy uh, problems with that, but I think that's um, which I'm sure we'll get to. But I think that that yes. you're kind of people are seeing. People are casting their votes, and they expect to see, you know, their voices translated into representation, and yet that kept being blocked. And why? And this was a, a signal achievement of the strategic communications around uh, gerrymandering. This phrase: uh, politicians are choosing their voters rather than having vo vote, uh, voters choose their politicians. Um, I think again, lots of different. It was the right time because it was some of the worst offenses. Um, in the context of just people feeling that government wasn't working for them anyway. Um, and so uh, we have, I think, been able to uh, marshal some good bipartisan understanding that this is a real political lockup that we need the, the courts to address. Just to follow up on that, Kathleen and, and Liz, uh, the the point that it's getting worse and that, that, that 2010 was a particularly bad year is quite true. The, of those, uh, I said that the Wisconsin map was one of the five worst in the last 50 years. All five of those were drawn in 2010. 
Uh, and so there is a clear um, problem of it becoming more prevalent and more severe uh, as a result, as Liz said, of, of technology, of computing power, data, and also as a result of the fact that people are becoming more predictable in their voting. They're, they're more likely to vote party than they used to be. The swing voter is a less frequent uh, phenomenon. And so a big theme in the argument <clears throat> was that uh, – we're on the precipice of a really bad situation. There's been legal uncertainty about the legality of all this uh, kind of behavior because of the Veith concurrence of Justice Kennedy, which was the fifth vote. But if they go ahead and say this is okay, we're not, or at least we're not going to have any kind of judicial remedy, it's not. It's going to be treated as a political question, so the courts won't intervene. Given where we're headed uh, in, with trends in gerrymandering, I think in the 2020 round after the next census, uh, when they, all the maps have to be redone, um, you're going to see massive uh, efforts to um, do the same thing Wisconsin did all over the country from both parties. Uh, and that uh, the result ultimately will be lots of places where, as uh, Wisconsin illustrates, it really doesn't matter which party gets most of the votes. The, the party that drew the map is going to stay in control. Uh, that's pretty pretty severely anti-democratic. Uh, those were all the themes I was able to, to get out in, in our oral argument, and I hope uh, will appeal to the justices, or at least some of them, most of them. Five is probably about the right number. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a good number. Um, yeah, so you know, that's all very interesting and kind of raises, uh, let me go to a more general co uh, question, and then I'll go back to another courtroom question. But just to the point of um, kind of whether this is a partisan issue or not, and kind of I know you know each party could be as equally susceptible at some level of trying to entrench themselves if given the opportunity. But have you, um, you know, both in your experience with this issue, found this to be something where, like, it, you know, not being obviously partisan is helpful to building support and making arguments, or is it actually at some level um, more partisan than it might seem? I'm just curious how that played into the dynamics of both the court case and the um, the kind of broader public conversation. Well, the, the 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 reality is that most of the gerrymanders back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s were done by Democrats, and now most of them are done by Republicans, just because they've done a better job of getting control of the key state legislatures in the 2000 and 2010. Uh, periods when there was a census and you had to redo the, a lot of the maps. And so, certainly that fig factors into the uh, analysis of who's on what side. And, the, in the, and there was a, a case back in the 80s challenging a Democratic gerrymander, and the Republican National Committee filed a brief supporting the plaintiffs. In, in this case, they filed a brief supporting the defendants uh, and kind of contradicted everything they had said back in the 80s in a case called Davis versus Bandemer. Uh, and on the other hand, we um, wanted to make sure everybody understands it really isn't a partisan issue ultimately. It's an issue of democracy. And um, we were pretty successful with a great amount of support from lots of organizations and um, volunteer efforts to recruit a lot of Republicans uh, to appear as, as amici in the case, including Senator McCain, Governor Kasich, Governor Schwarzenegger, Dole, Luger, Danforth, about a dozen members of the House of uh, Representatives who are Republicans. And so hopefully the message was a lot of people care about the quality of our democracy and are not willing to sacrifice that to the to sort of short-term partisan advantage. Uh, and uh, I think that message you know, certainly produced a lot of good publicity for us and, and hopefully got through to the court. You want to comment on that whole issue of partisanship too, Liz? But that was my my take. Sure. No, I think that that is critically important um, to uh, for this to be understood that this is a kind of sauce for the goose, sauce for the gander question of of where it oughtn't to be. Um, you you shouldn't fall down on it depending on your party affiliation and kind of where you stand because as small D Democrats, the real question is you know, our right to fair representation, essentially, and our right not to be discriminated against as, uh, you know, through viewpoint discrimination against our particular political views um, in violation of, of the Constitution. Uh, so I do, I think that it was critical that the, the court see it as um, a nonpartisan, I suppose I prefer to bipartisan, but a nonpartisan um, issue and that the top lines in uh, in the way that this is talked about, um, absolutely are, are positioned that way. I will also just say, as a progressive, however, that in the last several years, 
um, particularly, you know, since 2010, um, it has been it has been the uh, the progressive side and progressive public policies that majorities of Americans support and majorities of individuals at the state level support raising the minimum wage, uh, preventing gun violence, expanding Medicare, um, expanding uh, civil rights, and those. Um, progressive issues are the ones that have absolutely been blocked uh, by these distorted districts that are distorting the laws that we all um, live under. So it's particularly par problematic in this round from a progressive uh, standpoint because policy victories that people, you know, go to the polls to cast their ballot to have their voice heard so that government will be responsive and kind of, you know, help uh, shared prosperity, et cetera, advanced inclusiveness, all of these things that people are voting for, they're not getting. Um, and so that has had particularly deleterious impacts on uh, the kind of progressive scope um, of policy victories that people really support. So I think that's a particular injury. Um, but the general Democratic small d democratic injuries are bo born by, you know, all of the people that, that care about our democracy and our kind of political processes being fair and bounded by our constitutional rights. No, that's a, hopefully that's a, a point that we can at least agree on. Uh, no, that's, a, that's very interesting. Um, I'm curious too, you mentioned, I think one or both of you mentioned the issue of sort of the idea of this being viewpoint discrimination in a way, you know, to the extent that a, a political group is being targeted and excluded. And I'm just, you know, curious as the, you know, this is more on a doctrinal note and kind of a lawyerly question, but also just one of just a, a general interest of, you know, seeing this as a First Amendment issue, a speech issue um, versus seeing it as like a 14th Amendment issue and the various aspects of the 14th Amendment. I'm just curious, you know, maybe Paul to start, but obviously Liz, please, uh, you know, let us know your thoughts. You know, did you, Paul, do you find the First Amendment argument um, more of a expedient or persuasive or both? And, and how much do you think the doctrinal framework here matters as much as trying to get a practical test that will work for the court? Um, I mean, are they both equally important or is the, you know, doctrine or the, or the practical aspect um, one of those more important? Well, I guess I would say a couple of things about that. For, for one thing, um, Justice Kennedy suggested a First Amendment approach back in his Vieth concurrence in 2004, so that was something we very strongly uh, featured in the briefs, uh, and he's obviously a very strong advocate of uh, First Amendment protections in almost every context, uh, probably the strongest on the court. That said, it seems it's almost seemed to me that the equal protection argument and the First Amendment argument are the same argument or sort of two sides of the same coin, that you're discriminating against people based on their political point of view or you're burdening them because of their political point of view. It's sort of the same. Uh, and um, so... Uh, my, my personal point of view is that, that they really shouldn't make a lot of di dis difference at the doctrinal level, but if uh, uh, it, Justice Kennedy finds it and, and maybe other members of the court find it easier to think about it as a First Amendment matter, I think that's a perfectly valid argument. If a government sets out to use the law to decide winners and losers in the political process based on the government's agreement with one party's agenda and disagreement with the other party's agenda, then the uh, the extra burdens put on the ability of the, the disfavored party to translate their votes into seats. It's, it's, it clearly has to be a First Amendment problem. Uh, and, uh, I actually don't know that anybody disagrees with that. It's just a question of justiciability, whether or not you can measure this in, 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 uh, well enough so that the court can tell which maps to are, are just uh, politics as usual and which maps really go over the line, uh, which is, seems to be how they think about it. Uh, and um, so that was what we were trying to establish with these these statistical tests. Uh, and the other thing that was was interesting in argument was we had uh, the, the argument. One of the arguments we were facing was the notion that our plaintiffs did not have standing to bring the kind of statewide claim uh, that they they brought. The argument was I'm a Democrat. I live in one part of Wisconsin, uh, but all of us as a group. The political party have suffered a First Amendment violation or an equal protection violation because of the laws targeting our group for a particular burden. 
Uh, and that that burden is, is a collective injury inflicted on all Democrats equally in the state, and then they can attack the whole map. The argument in response from the, the defendants was, well, but you can't sue. Uh, you should only be able to challenge your own district. That's the only place you vote and the only place where you individually get representation. Uh, and it was interesting at the argument that Justice Kennedy seemed to suggest, you know, reading um, the tea leaves a little bit when you gleaning this from a, a few few things he said, but what he seemed to be of the view that the First Amendment argument about uh, the burden being disparately imposed on one party uh, kind of solved the, the standing problem. Uh, and so that, that will continue to be a, a, a big feature of how we think about this, that, that this is a First Amendment problem. That, that's very interesting that it could tie into the standing point, too. Um, Liz, do you, do you, from the public-facing view, do you notice any difference in what, how this issue is framed, constitutionally speaking, or is it more the practical effects that matter to the people that are you guys are trying to reach? Um, I think more the practical effects. I will say, I mean, you know, there there were depend there. It depends on uh, what kind of audience you're seeking to reach. I'm reminded this weekend I saw some poll about how few people are actually able to even name. Um, all three or even one of the branches of government. So, no, not trying to parse as between the First or Fourteenth Amendment injury uh, here, generally in strategic communications. Um, I will <laughs> say, though, to that to that point, um, or I think and the question that you raised about kind of the court um, getting involved in um, in politics, or someone was saying. You know, I think we we probably they all agree that it would be bad if the court was, you know, if 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 one party was discriminating against other voters. But you know, who could we tell? I was um, I was concerned uh, with Roberts's position. Again, not necessarily concerned vis-a-vis -vis the votes and the outcomes of the case, because unfortunately, much as um, you know, as Paul. Uh, said the swing voter um, version of voting has gone something by the wayside because voters are more uh, predictable. Um, justices are nowadays um, often somewhat more predictable as well. So, so I'm not concerned because I think, I think, oh no, this definitely means we're going to lose this vote that we might otherwise have had. But I still think that um, Roberts is the 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 position that Roberts appears to hold that comes shining through in his campaign finance jurisdiction as well, um, particularly most recently in McCutcheon, um, of the idea that politics is just, you know, inherently corrupting or just, you know, kind of a, a, a you know, a dirty morass and um, there's no way to separate kind of what is or isn't, you know, we shouldn't get into politics. You know, he said that the intelligent man on the street would worry that these rulings are a bunch of baloney because they themselves would be seen to be operating out of partisanship, unclear, um, but not constitutional principle. Like there's, like there isn't a role in, uh, for the Supreme Court in defending democratic rights. You know, I thought it was very, Disturbing, and I mean not to say nothing of Gorsuch's, uh, you know, far more um, radical view of that when he questioned where the court even gets the authority to revise state legislative lines, um, and you know, uh, Ginsburg had to go back all the way to the first principles of one person, one vote. Um, I just came from running a workshop. A transpartisan workshop on the idea of defending the idea of liberal democracy since we appear to perhaps have become a little complacent in building the intellectual case for why we even ought to live in this kind of liberal democracy. Um, but I don't think that some of the members on the court are really helping with their view that democracy is just, you know, inherently corrupting and there's no real role that they can play. People should just duke it out in the political sphere. I don't know, Paul, if that's something that you wanted to, if you had thoughts on that or... That's just how I feel reading these cases. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, th I, th I thought it was interesting, um, the, um, the the speech I got from the Chief Justice about his concern that the court will, be, will lose legitimacy if they start adjudicating a lot of these partisan gerrymandering cases because they will be perceived as picking winners and losers based on 
party preference rather than on the constitutional merits. Um, I think he is actually um, quite sincerely concerned as the Chief Justice to maintain the image of the court as a as a, a, a body that applies law and doesn't just uh, vote preference, uh, partisanship, or ideology. And that's something that, that naturally chief justices do worry about. And uh, I can see where the issue is even more significant now that you have for the first time a court that's divided ideologically, uh, but also at the same time with each wing of the court matching the, the political party of the president that appointed them. Um, and it's something that wasn't true in the past. Uh, all that said, it doesn't seem to me that this is the case to start um, saying we're not going to do things. This is where core democratic principles are at stake. Uh, and you know, some, there was a, there was a after the fact, I was sort of saying to myself, "Gee, I wish I'd been able to say what I wouldn't have said in, in reality." Which is, maybe you should have worried about that when Citizens United and McCutcheon and Bush v. Gore were being decided before you, <laughs> instead of in this case. But, yeah. Uh, the bottom line, I think, is he means that very sincerely. It is a real concern on his mind. But this is this the the point I made was well maybe uh, you should worry about that. It's legitimate. But when our democracy is about to go south in in a big way in the next round of redistricting, if you give a green light to this kind of abusive practice, that's got to be more important. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's very interesting, and I, I guess I'd be remiss not to break. I mean, you, you're alluding to the moment. I think I wasn't there for the argument, but of of you know Justice Ginsburg kind of having to help um, help reinstruct some of the court on the genesis of some of the key precedents at issue. But um, did it come off? Did it come off? Came up more with Gorsuch actually rather than right. the Chief Justice. Right. Yeah, yeah. With, um, this, with the spice rub and everything. But was that? Was that? How was? <laughs> What was that? it sounds like I got Paul you were there so you can you can uh, recount it but it was a moment of it, it at least struck me on just reading the transcript of when you're you know kind of analogizing the test for figuring out a constitutional right to a spice rub it's hard to not see that as a little bit dismissive of the uh, of the nature of what's going on but you I know, also that, wonder that particular line I didn't mind I mean he was basically saying yeah, yeah. it seems like you haven't given us a, a clear numeric boundary line between how much is too much and we our theme was, right. well you have these tools and you should let the lower courts wrestle with them for a while before you start saying that 0.7 or 0.8 is the cutoff. Uh, instead of, since this map is so clearly over the line, um, but by a mile, that uh, you, you don't necessarily have to say, just deal with all the close cases that'll come along later. Right now, all that said, that he then goes into Justice Gorsuch went into a discussion of why it is uh, that the courts have any ability to supervise um, redistricting at all, the federal courts. Uh, and he seemed to, uh, he started rattling off other amendments, uh, 17th, 19th, Section 2 of the 14th, and didn't seem to sort of buy the uh, basic premise that the First Amendment and the 14th Amendment, as they've been applied since in cases going back a long time to regulate the states are somehow uh, are still in force. It was, it was interesting and confusing. Uh, and that's when Justice Ginsburg said, look, one person, one vote, equal protection, 1962. Um, what's the problem? This is another form of discrimination. Uh, and uh, so I was, she gave me a nice little help out there. Hmm. Yeah, that's no, that sounded like a pr pretty interesting uh, moment. I know we need to uh, also leave time for other questions. I had maybe one more question for you both, and then we can open that up if that makes sense. Um, but I'm, I, I was curious about just to the point of partially what you're talking about and just the kind of racial uh, gerrymandering and the racial uh, discrimination in the voting process that's been something that the court has grappled with for decades and has actually kind of found a way to do it in a way that they have not yet uh, dove into the – uh, partisan gerrymandering sphere. I was just curious for both of your reactions about kind of the how useful the racial gerrymandering um, you know strain of case law and just the kind of popular uh, perception of that issue is useful useful here or is it actually just kind of create a minefield a minefield that makes it hard to deploy it uh, effectively in this context? Well, from our point of view, it was actually more of a problem than a solution because that was the, the line of cases that the state was pointing to as a, when they were arguing that we shouldn't have the standing to bring a statewide challenge because in racial gerrymandering cases, you can't challenge the whole map. You just challenge particular districts. Uh, and so uh, they, that was their their best line of cases. And the answer to that was, well, but those are the racial gerrymandering doctrine really has the same word in it, but it's a very different kind of a doctrine. It's about... Any, a, a given minority district had where, where the argument is that 
race was excessively considered in the drawing of that particular district. And, and so uh, it makes sense that standing would be limited to people who are living in that district. Whereas here, the, the argument is there's no one district's right or wrong. It's the, it's the pattern of the disparate packing and cracking of people across the whole state that causes the ultimate uh, discrimination of making it much harder for the Democrats to get, in this case Democrats, to get uh, seats from their votes uh, than it is for the Republicans. And so the, the racial gerrymandering analogy um, uh, ended up being something we had to deal with more than make use of. Um, it is interesting, though, that a lot of the, the, the racial gerrymandering cases that have been brought in recent years were, in, to some extent, partisan gerrymandering cases dressed up that way. What happened in the South, in Alabama, North Carolina, Virginia, and other places in this last round of redistricting is people wanted to draw more partisan maps, but they didn't want to admit it. So they they made these they, they did it by packing more African Americans into the minority districts in those states. Uh, more than were needed to make them effective minority districts. And they claimed they were doing it to follow the Voting Rights Act, but the court has systematically, the Supreme Court has systematically um, rejected those arguments because they weren't really correct interpretations of the Voting Rights Act, uh, and they were, and they ended up hurting themselves because they were using race as a proxy to achieve their political agenda. And all those maps have been held unconstitutional now. And then, Paul, wasn't it... Wasn't it also in North Carolina where, you know, I mean, it's 2017 and we're litigating the 2010 map, so God yeah. help us, but North, Car okay. North Carolina has, sorry, what, I'll just say in North Carolina, they've gone back up and back down in their challenges right. to the to the state, you know, to the state legislative seats, and then there's ca challenges to the congressional. Uh, right, you know, well, the, the congressional district. was held unconstitutional as a racial gerrymander, uh, and so and then they back went in, back. in 2016, and they announced, all right, well, we're going to keep a 10-3 advantage in the map. We're just going to do it. We're going to tell the map drawer, draw 10 Republican seats and three Democratic seats. Uh, we're not going to consider race at all. And uh, they asked him, why did you, um, this is the, the head, head of registering for the, the Republicans in the legislature, why, why, didn't, why did you decide to draw a 10-3 map? And he said, because I didn't think we could draw an 11-2 map. You know? And so they've gone back yeah. to naked partisan gerrymandering uh, with no more pretense that it has anything to do with the Voting Rights Act. But, and also, it's, I think that they're just really, and here's hoping, but completely way too clever by half to say, ha ha, you told us that this was an improper racial gerrymander, so no, this isn't about racial considerations, this is just about Democratic voters, wink, wink. You know, this well, is entirely based... They were making a that we were going to lose the Wisconsin case, I guess. <laughs> yeah, you know, they, they, they came out and said this is entirely based on partisan, not racial criteria. But, you know, again, like, that, how can that be okay? <laughs> we are just disadvantaging Democrats oughtn't to be um, acceptable, and if it is, you know, they will be even further off to the races. I should just, um, for folks who are, who are calling in and kind of interested in the background of this, uh, of this issue and kind of of this moment that we're at, in 2010, there really was an intentional um, Republican uh, strategy called the Red, the Red Map Strategy, uh, to invest, this is Carl Rove supported this, to um, fundraise and then invest money in um, electing, you know, in taking over state houses for the purpose of being able to manipulate redistricting. And they said in their fundraising memo, we think that we can take uh, 25 of the currently competitive federal districts off the table. Like, this is just an early investment, Republican donors. You won't have to give money to combat these congressional races every two years for the next decade because we will just uh, manipulate the math at maps at the outside outset of the districts um, to take these competitive districts off the table. And that, uh, you know, again, like the idea that the court would um, countenance that or consider themselves... Um, without recourse, uh, I think would be incredibly um, damaging for democracy because the question is, you know, we should be able to be fighting um, on the strength of people's ideas uh, at the ballot and not um, either be, uh, you know, putting impro uh, improper barriers to access uh, for voters through voter suppression and 
I will say the court has a very important voter suppression case coming out on November, uh, November 8th, um, but nor should this kind of political lockup uh, be allowed through just the more upstream process of, um, of manipulating the districts to disadvantage uh, voters of the other party. So I do hope that that kind of understanding of this as a question of political lockup, that only the court can set guardrails for what is an unconstitutional abuse, that that might, um, you know, certainly sway Kennedy and, you know, perhaps even move forward for folks who who worry that this is just, that this might, you know, be seen as a, um, as a overreach by the court, that this is instead uh, really a necessary role for the court because it's like the only recourse when the political uh, arenas themselves have already been um, kind of foreclosed by these abuses. Um, Paul, Paul, uh, Paul Fowler, I don't, is, are there questions that you'd like to um, ask that have been written in? I, have a, I can a add another question if, if not, but let me know. Sure. I mean, I got a couple. So why don't I ask one of these now, and then you have one more question, so we can always end with that. Um, Great. So I have a couple questions. This one seems to be far more ideological than anything, but it reads, over the summer, Justice Ginsburg said that this may be the most, uh, the important, may be the most important uh, of the term. I have to assume that you all most likely agree. How far reaching does this decision have the potential to be? Well, I guess it depends on how big a problem you think gerrymandering is. I think it's a major problem. Uh, and, uh, you know, while the court, some of it depends on how the court writes it. If, if they put meaningful limitations on gerrymandering, it could have a really uh, significant effect on the quality of democracy. And, and given how much worse things are going to get if they don't, uh, that, that I think it is clearly one of the most important cases in the, of the term, maybe more than just one term. Yeah, I mean, I I would agree um, with that. I think there are always several important um, cases. Uh, but oh, sure, this, of course. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just trying to. I'm just thinking about the union representation case that's coming down again, and then really the Houston v. APRI, because if, if people are able to, but that's just the kind of the democracy. Leaving <laughs> aside the cake shop case, you know, which is- Leaving aside, yeah, right I mean, really. So, but as well, there are a handful of states that are the worst on these measures, there are a handful of cases that are the most important cases this term, and this is clearly one of them. Um, for all the reasons that Paul just said, and because, again, and I'm happy to, you know, if we're doing follow-on materials, I'm happy to um, send around some fact sheets with just kind of the examples of why this matters in people's lives. But I talked about the, Mich the Wisconsin votes. In Michigan, uh, in the last election, the GOP's share of votes cast was 50 percent, but they got 58 percent of the seats. In Ohio, they got 59% uh, of the votes, but 67% of the seats. Um, and in North Carolina, 53% of the votes, but 62% of the seats. Um, and, you know, let's just for one example, in Michigan, right, voters in Michigan had um, overturned the uh, state emergency manager law in 2012. That's the law that allowed the state to take over local governments um, if they were facing uh, fiscal issues, if the state decided that. The legislature, you know, now kind of improperly dominated by Republicans through these gerrymandered districts, then passed a new version of that law um, and through which the emergency manager was able to take over the local government of Flint uh, and change their water supply. We all know the toxic levels of lead that coursed through um, and poisoned the children in that city. So, I mean, these really, it matters both because of the future for our democracy and these kind of doctrinal reasons, but I think the, the role of the folks outside of the court, um, at least, and certainly the, our program here, has really been trying, try, uh, has been focused on trying to break through about what this matter, what this means to people in a day-to-day -day, uh, live issue. And I'll add one other data point, just again in Michigan, because this is the one I'm looking at. In 2013, 
The vast majority of Michiganders supported adoption rights for same-sex couples. More than 75% support laws banning discrimination against LGBTQ people. But in 2015, the state legislature passed a law that allows adoption agencies to discriminate against same-sex couples in the name of religious freedom. We found similar examples, obviously, in North Carolina, uh, also in Ohio on civil rights, um, and also in Virginia uh, and civil rights. So whether it comes down to um, raising the minimum wage, more equitable tax burden um, sharing, um, expanding Medicaid for access to health care, education funding, um, or you know, expanding and not reversing civil rights protections, the, these, these partisan gerrymanders at the state level have really led to um, a regression in uh, policy, in representation, and therefore a failure of policy to reflect the preferences of the people in that state. And that has horrible impacts for people's lived lives and horrible impacts for kind of trust in liberal democracy going forward. Um. This is Kathleen. I, I, I guess one one uh, thought that I've had with some of your the comments that you know about the kind of highlight cases and the bit high profile issues is partially um like the the current administration is um, taking interesting positions and at least some of them in this case the administration is not directly involved but I'm just curious if if it, what if any um, if involvement has the federal government had on these issues or is this uh, an area really where they there's not a role and there has not been a role in the public conversation um, at least so far. The Justice Department has never filed a brief in a partisan gerrymandering case, and there have been three other over the past you know, few decades. Um, because the states do the drawing of the maps, uh, and there's no obvious federal interest in having uh, the maps stay biased, or you know, it's just even congressional maps. So they've stayed out of this. They get involved in all the racial cases, but not in the partisan cases. And there was an effort made by Wisconsin to persuade the, the Justice Department in this instance to to get in and file a brief on their side. Uh, and we went through the usual process of meetings with the, both sides went in and met with the Solicitor General's office. Uh, and they ended up not filing again, so I was I was pleased to see that because I didn't necessarily think it was going to be very helpful if they did. Oh, that that's interesting. I hadn't realized that, and I guess that's a uh, something that uh, sounds like a good exercise of discretion there. Um, <laughs> um, Paul, do you are there any other uh, questions from the group that we should uh, share? Yeah, there is one more that I want to ask. I know that we're running out of time, um, but this question is. Uh, what uh, will the result of this case mean for 2018 if the court sides with the original plaintiffs? Will Wisconsin and other legislatures have to change their state's voting maps immediately? Uh, we hope so. Uh, the part of that may depend on how quickly they decide the case, but they did accelerate the argument um, to a date even before the reply briefs were going to be due. So. I'm hoping that means they have some sense that, that uh, they should accelerate the outcome and get it decided not in June, but maybe in the winter or early spring, which give time to, uh, if we win, to, to redo the maps in Wisconsin. Uh, it will also I give, give more time for people to bring lawsuits elsewhere. <laughs> That's great. Um, well, thank you. I, Paul, Paul, should we, do we have time for any more questions, or are we, are we at time here? I think we're just about out of time. Um, I do want to thank uh, you all and all of our listeners uh, for taking the time to participate in this call in today. Um, I'll just give uh, one last statement, which is that the National LGBT Bar Association can't continue putting together uh, programming such as this without uh, all of our listeners and supporters continued support. Uh, if you'd like to see more cutting edge legal analysis, please consider becoming a member of the bar, renewing your existing membership. If you want to learn more, visit our website, which is lgbtbar.org. Uh, something to save the date for is uh, we are planning another call in to address the Colorado uh, cake shop case at the end of the month. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, and with that, uh, Kathleen, Liz, Paul, I just want to thank you so much again for taking the time um, for this today.